Hello and welcome. This is James from the DSO Imager channel. Uh, today I'm going to do a quick video on uh, what to do if you're interested in getting your uh, rig over at Starfront. Now, a couple days ago I posted a video comparing uh, data of the California Nebula that I took from my Bortle 5 backyard to data that I captured uh, from the Starfront Observatory. I had just recently sent my um, 65 millimeter refractor over to Starfront. And in that video, I started getting a lot of questions about, um, I guess, really more questions about how to do things at Starfront, how to how to get started, how to uh, operate your telescope, questions about remoting in and, and calibration file, files and stuff like that. And so I thought I'd put together a really rough video here, kind of going through the whole process and sharing my experiences. All right, so uh, this uh, video is broken down into four parts, really. Uh, the first part will just be uh, the intro and steps to do to your rig to get ready. Um, some information that I wish I had known before I sent my scope out there. Uh, then I'm going to go over th very briefly the uh, how remote desktops handled and how you transfer your files. That's the big, the two big questions that I get. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about my experiences personally, how everything went. Uh, and then we'll finish this video with a little tour of my rig where I'm actually going to remote in and uh, we can take a look at it. Uh, it is uh, still daylight out, so we're not going to see it. And, and actually, it's going to rain tonight, so there won't be any action tonight. But you guys will be able to see how, uh, how I'm remoting into it and, and controlling it and whatnot. All right, so first, let's go over Starfront's website. I mean... I'm sharing information here and it's my experience but really all the information is is coming from Starfront and if you do decide to uh, send your gear down the Starfront uh, you know don't don't take my information as as the final word all communication gets handled through Starfront I'm just a guy on the internet who happened to send his scope there so I don't want any misconceptions. Maybe they changed their process. You know, this video is going to be up for who knows how long, and maybe uh, next month, uh, Starfront will make changes. So, always start with their website and go through them with all communications and questions. Okay, so uh, obviously, if you're here at their main website. Uh, and you're looking at reserving a peer, you can click here. This shows all their different tiers. Uh, they're talking about a swing diameter, and we'll go over that in a second. Uh, but when you pick your tier and you pay for it, that payment is basically your deposit, and it includes your installation fee. Uh, so for the most part, they're going to set everything up for you and it's not going to cost extra. There are some exceptions in there and you know, you can go through that uh, with their with their website. Uh, and they do have a pretty good frequently asked questions. So even before asking someone else like myself or reaching out to them, uh, I do recommend reading through all of these frequently asked questions. And then if you got a question uh, that you uh, that wasn't addressed in here, then reach out to them. Uh, using this form. Um, I have found that their response time to email requests is about 24 to 36 hours. So I would ex wouldn't expect an immediate response, uh, but you'll get a response. It probably has a lot to do with how busy they are, how much uh, work is going on at the moment, uh, and when these guys have a chance to sit down and respond to emails. So just I that, that kind of delay did not bother me. If you're someone that needs like constant replies I mean you know they don't have any customer service reps sitting out there <laughs> right so th this place is literally in the middle of nowhere and these guys live on premise so there's only a few of them and, and I would keep that under under consideration now all communication with them is handled through either email uh, you'll get a reply here and then that will start an email chain uh, and or handled through Discord. Uh, if you're not familiar with Discord, it's just uh, kind of like a chat room thing. So it's like Microsoft Teams or Google Chats or ICQ if, uh, if you go back far enough. <laughs> uh, but here it is. If you're not on Discord, it's definitely worth setting up 
a Discord account so that you can access this uh, because uh, their ticket system, their troubleshooting system is all managed through Discord. Now I'll come back to uh, Discord in a minute when we get to that section, but I want to continue with the uh, getting started uh, section. Now the next thing is the swing diameter that you want to consider. And let's see, let's get back to their home page. Yeah, so they're talking about uh, the pier size and swing diameter. And what I recommend is you go watch this video that Bray put out about measuring swing diameter. He's basically, dem in this freeze of this video, he's demonstrating what the swing diameter is. But uh, watch this video uh, so that you fully understand uh, the swing rate, uh, swing diameter, and that way you're not, uh, there's no surprises when you send your rig out there and they're telling you that it's uh, taking up more space than you thought it would. All right, and uh, this is uh, just a list uh, that I put together of things that you're going to want to check. Uh, this has everything that I can think of at the moment when I put this uh, slide deck uh, together. So I'm sure there'll be something that I realize I forgot after I post this. Uh, and again, if there's any question or doubt or anything, please uh, communicate with Starfront uh, before sending your gear out. Uh, that way this whole process goes as smoothly as possible. The more prepared your rig is, the smoother the whole process is going to go. So keep that in mind. And I mean, most of this is, should be obvious, but uh, uh, the night before I dropped my rig off over there, I set the whole thing up in my kitchen and made sure everything worked. Uh, so yeah, make sure your camera cools down and take some test captures just to make sure it can download uh, the pictures from the camera, that sort of thing. Uh, make sure the focuser, filter wheel, and any other accessories you have, like a flip flap or a rotate or anything, make sure all that stuff connects and make sure it all works. So I connected to my focus wheel, uh, focuser and filter wheel. I manually moved the focuser in and out a little bit. I manually changed filters just to make sure everything was good there. Uh, and of course, make sure that you can connect to the mount and that the mount actually moves, <laughs> that you can control it. Um, you're going to want to inspect all USB ports. Uh, I got a funny story related to that one uh, that I'll come back to. And I also recommend replacing any worn or uh, worn USB cables. In fact, I ordered a whole new set of USB cables before I sent my rig out there. Uh, I'm not far from Starfront. Starfront advertises 200 to 250 clear nights a year. Uh, I get about the same number from my backyard. And my rigs are in my backyard uh, I, I, the whole time, uh, under covers. I only bring them in unless uh, if we're going to have severe weather. So uh, all my cables and everything has been outside that whole time. And, and USB cables... Uh, they just don't last very long. I've gone through so many USB cables. You wouldn't think, but yeah, they uh, uh, they don't they don't last long. So I do recommend getting quality, brand new USB cables and then testing them out, of course, uh, before sending it out there. Now, if a cable goes bad or whatever, they do have cables out there. They'll charge you for it. Uh, I don't know how much you're charging for USB cables. I'm sure it's reasonable. Uh, but it's still going to be more expensive than if you just order it to yourself uh, off of Amazon or whatever. All right, if you're running a mini PC uh, on your rig, uh, it's got a auto power feature in the BIOS. You want to make sure that that's enabled. Basically what happens is, let's say there's a power outage and the whole rig shuts down. When power is restored, uh, your mini PC will still be powered off. Uh, if you enable this uh, feature, then when power is restored, the, uh, the mini PC should boot up automatically. So that's a, a useful thing. Now, this next uh, bullet here, I get a lot of questions on. Uh, understandably, from home, with my rigs in the backyard, I'm using um, Microsoft Remote Desktop. Uh, there are other remote desktop tools out there. But the question is, how do you control your uh, your rig, your mini PC, how do you access it while it's at Starfront? And the answer is to use Chrome Desktop. 
it actually works uh, and it works well so you can install the app on your mini PC and uh, of course you're going to want to do this before uh, you send your rig out there and this is something else to test before you pack it all up and send it out make sure you can remote into it now you're going to want to have uh, uh, some way of controlling power to the rig outside of your Pegasus power box or anything like that and that's where these uh, CASA um, plugs come from now you can if you have some other brand or some other type of remotely controlled plug you can send it out there and they'll put it on there if you don't have anything um, they actually have these on site and uh, you can buy one from them or you can order one from Amazon and send it out there whatever CASA is the brand that they're using and that seems to be what they're most familiar with it's easy uh, you just install the CASA app on your phone and then you get access to it and they're in, in mine I'll, I'll share a screenshot later but um, uh, you can power cycle basically your rig through these remote plugs which could be handy in a troubleshooting type scenario where you might be able to solve a problem without having to open a support ticket and lastly I do recommend building a dark library uh, before you send your rig out there that way you have those calibration frames ready to go uh, the one thing to keep in mind is that uh, especially if you're from a, a light polluted area and you're sending your rig out here to these dark skies your exposures are going to be longer and you may find that you even need to use a higher gain setting than what you're used to uh, it can be a little tricky uh, but if you know ahead of time <laughs> when you're sending your rig out you should have a night or two where you can have it in your you know in, in a test environment and just kind of speculate on how long your exposures are going to be. You can even ask people on the Discord chat, uh, general chat, to get an idea of uh, what, you, what kind of settings you're going to be using. Now, if you don't build the dark library, it's not really that big a deal. Uh, and I'll go over that uh, soon in this uh, presentation. But it is possible to get your calibration frames, all of them, while, you, while your rig's out there. But... I mean that first night if if you're collecting data that first night and you're excited and you want to see how it's looking uh, it'll look better if you already had some dark frames so something to think about all right now I am a little bit under three hours away uh, from Starfront so I didn't feel the need to ship my stuff over there I just dropped it off uh, for their drop-offs the window is a little tight it's only on weekends and it's between 1 to 3 p.m. now that's how it is currently or at least uh, within the past couple of weeks maybe they've changed that but all of that can be communicated through email after you reserve your peer uh, also just to set expectations I don't expect access to the observatories they generally do not want anybody walking into the observatories uh, and it makes sense those rigs are in there pretty tight I mean they're using that swing diameter and adding a couple inches uh, to make sure there's no accidental collisions by scopes but that's it so especially when you get into like the the mini the mini pier and the small pier they are close and um, I could see somebody accidentally bumping into a rig if they're not you know familiar with that area so they're not letting anybody in there uh, I wouldn't expect it. Uh, the day I showed up, they were not that busy, and they did let me take a peek inside the rigs, but I did not walk inside and, and amongst all the rigs. It was kind of like standing at the doorway and taking a look and seeing the construction of uh, the three more uh, buildings that they were building. As far as how long it takes to get your rig uh, mounted, assuming all of your components are there, um, I think it, it depends on um, on how busy they are. Now, my rig was mounted in just two days, which was really fast. And reading through the comments on Discord of other people's experiences, uh, this was considerably quicker than most. So uh, I think I was the exception, not the rule. It also probably helped that uh, because I ran my rig as a semi-remote set up in my backyard I had everything basically mounted on my telescope the mini PC the Pegasus box uh, 
everything was is was on that rail so other than a couple of cables it's very easy so there was really nothing there for those guys to have to put together they didn't have to install the focuser you know establish uh, the focuser calibration they didn't have to do any of that i had already everything mounted so i made it easy for them and they were able to pop it on their uh on their mount uh really easy now with that said if i was shipping my rig <laughs> I wouldn't ship it the way the way I brought it over there. I mean, I just had sitting in a plastic bin on the back seat of my truck. If uh, if I were to ship this thing, ideally you would use all the original boxes that your gear is shipped in, and so you would you would need these guys to assemble your rig, and that's not a bad thing because you consider how many rigs these guys have put together. Chances are they're more experienced than you when it comes to building rigs, especially the type the type of common rigs that are going out there so that's just one thing to consider i i mean communicate with starfront again but i'm sure they would recommend against you just putting an assembled rig in a box and sending it out there too many chances too many connections uh for uh things that get stressed for usb ports to get stressed so it's just it's not wouldn't be a good idea all right so uh let's go over a discord really quick all right, so here's Discord. If you're not familiar with Discord, you can either run it in a browser, uh, just go to discord.com, or you can install an app, run it on an app on your PC or on your phone or whatever. Uh, when you log in, you can go to Starfront, and Starfront's Discord is open to the public. Uh, this main area, this is all public stuff. So people posting in here, uh, can be uh, Starfront customers or not, but anyone is welcome to post in here. Uh, here's the little welcome thing with the standard rules. Uh, here's the verify here. So this is where you need to go to get access to the customer only section. And uh, here's the information here. Basically, once you uh, reserve your peer, you verify here and then you'll get granted uh, customer only access all right uh, in the customer only access I'll probably go over this again but there's a roof status which is very good we got general over here uh, let's see and then the main thing I want to show go over is a support ticket so there's two different types of support tickets. There's just a general tech support ticket. This is if you got some kind of trouble and you need help from on-site staff. And this is your initial install ticket. Uh, so note that please submit your ticket only after we have received all your equipment, including any emailed copy of return labels. Yeah, so if you're sending them a case, like a nice box, and you want that box back, uh, make sure you give them a return label so they can ship that back to you. And so it's this initial install ticket uh, that triggers the uh, getting your gear in queue to be physically installed on the pier. And any kind of issues that they may run into while setting up your stuff, they'll discuss it. So what will happen is you'll get a separate, here's a submit support ticket, you'll get a separate entry in here. Uh, for your uh, ticket and then you'll have communication with Starfront and how things are going with the with the install if they have any questions if they come into any problem discover any problems or if you have additional questions related to uh, your initial install okay and uh, I thought I'd go over a couple of problems I ran into uh, so the first one, I didn't have that auto start uh, feature in my BIOS enabled. I was kind of pressed for time and I just neglected to do that setting. That one's all on me. Um, I had to jump on a plane the very next day to go to some unexpected work project. So I failed to do that, but it was no big deal. Uh, uh, I let them know that in the uh, initial install ticket and they were able to enable it for me. So no problems there. Now, the next issue is that uh, they got back to me and told me that my EAF, the USB port of my EAF, 
uh, was damaged. And basically, they sent me a picture. I don't have it handy, but uh, this housing in the center, this whole plug here was missing. <laughs> so it's like, well, how would that happen, right? I mean, did Starfront damage it on the install? I mean, that might be someone's first thought. Uh, but no, and after this happened, this was quite a surprise when he reported this and I saw the picture. I was like, holy crap, I just, it worked the the night before I drove it out there. So how how could I have been in this situation? So a couple days after uh, this revelation was brought forth, uh, I started to remember some stuff that went on <laughs> a few months ago. I remember distinctly trying to plug a USB cable into the filter wheel of of a different rig of my Celestron 8-inch uh, edge and so same type of port and I couldn't get the cable to fit into uh, that port and I couldn't understand why that was and it turned out that the housing was uh, already there was already a housing in that filter wheel like I plugged the cable in there and took the cable out and a housing was left in there. No, I'm getting that backwards. The housing was stuck in the cable. That's what it was. <laughs> so there was a housing in the cable on the USB cable and obviously couldn't fit because it was buttoned up against the housing that was in the, um, in the filter wheel. And I, I it, that, that threw me for a loop because I'm like, all right, well, okay, that explains why I couldn't get the cable in. But where did this housing come from? I couldn't figure out, but everything was working. And so I was like, eh, whatever. And I just tossed it and didn't give it a, a second thought. Now, as I said, this this issue with the cable and the discovery of this mystery uh, <laughs> housing uh, happened a few months ago. And I'm now recalling there was a couple of times since then where I seem to have lost connectivity with that uh, EAF. And just like disconnecting and reconnecting in um, in Sequence Generator Pro, which is why I'm using the Drive My Rigs, uh, seemed to work. But there was a few times where the focus also seemed off on some of my captures. So I didn't put two to two together until the rig got out there and they discovered that that housing port was missing. So I must have run <laughs> that, that focuser for a, at least a couple of months with that housing missing and it worked for the most part so anyway I needed to get that EAF replaced and that was pretty easy I ordered it from uh, High Point Scientific they had some in stock and I shipped it directly from High Point to Starfront I used my name so that's how they knew it was for my rig uh, but otherwise it went straight to Starfront it took like two days three days to get there and a day or two after they received it it was installed. All right, let's uh, talk about uh, Chrome Remote Desktop. So obviously you need a Google account to start this. You do not have to run it in Chrome. I ran it on um, Internet Explorer, not Internet Explorer, Microsoft Edge. And Microsoft Edge is basically the Microsoft rebadged version of Google Chrome. So there you go. <laughs> uh, you could either run Chrome Remote Desktop in a browser or you can install an app. Now this is just a screenshot of what it looks like when I remote in. I just wanted to kind of show this to you. So you definitely need to get this installed on the remote PC. So this whole thing here, set up remote access, you're going to download that and run through the wizard. And uh, here's a little browser. So like on the computer that you're doing this, let's say you're getting this, uh, you, you open this up from your your home PC, you can choose to install uh, the app local on your PC. Or, like I said, you could just run it through a browser. Either way works. Now, I'm not going to go through the whole setup process because with Chrome Desktop because, one, I've already done it, and two, there's actually a lot of videos out there specifically about Chrome Remote Desktop. So, if you're not familiar with Chrome Remote Desktop or you haven't, uh, you got any questions, I do recommend checking out one of the many videos that are out there that cover that. Uh, but the I had never done it before because I've been using uh, 
Microsoft Remote Desktop, and it wasn't hard. The wizards take you through the process. All right. After you do that, though, uh, you have your remote devices. So this is going to show a list of any computer that you went through this process on. And so Astro 3 is my uh, mini PC that's sitting out in um, out in Starfront. All right, and uh, don't worry, at the end of this whole, uh, the last thing in this whole video, I'm actually going to remote in. So if that's what you want to see, uh, we'll get there. Uh, almost finished. Uh, okay, so file transfer options. This is another big question that I get. Um, I think you, the Google Drive actually is, it makes it pretty easy and it's uh, free. Uh, you could use Dropbox or you can use any other file transfer service that you may already have. I mean, you're remoting into your PC. So it's it's just like anything else. I mean, how would you share files, uh, you know, across uh, two of your computers uh, that are at different locations? You would probably use something like Dropbox. Uh, the only thing with Chrome Desktop is that you can do file transfers through Chrome Desktop, uh, upload and download, but it only allows you to do it one file at a time. So if you've captured 50 frames over one night, for example, that would be a real pain in the rear to uh, download all of that. So the way I've got the workaround that I'm using currently with Google Drive is uh, I just zip up all the pictures from the night's run into a single file and then I transfer the single file onto Google Drive and then download it. So if anyone's got a better way to do it in Google Drive, uh, let me know. But I mean, that process doesn't take long. Uh, the, the internet connection out there is really, really good. So it'll take me three minutes, four minutes for my mini PC to zip up a uh, two or three gigs worth of data from that night. Uh, and then the upload uh, to Google Drive takes mere seconds. So nice and fast and the download is equally as quick. And kind of like I said with uh, Chrome Remote Desktop, there's a lot of help videos out there specifically on Google Drive. So if you've never used Google Drive, uh, you can get that information there. It's not, it's not uh, complicated at all. And um, uh, if you have a Google account, which you're going to, if you had to create one to get Chrome Remote Desktop, you also have uh, Google Drive. And I think Google Drive gives you free 15 gigs of storage, something like that. So pretty generous, uh, in my opinion, for, uh, for a free service. <laughs> so, yeah, take advantage of that. Okay, I kind of already showed you the roof status chat in Discord. It's a good place to go to see if they're opening the roof or they're closing the roof. Obviously, weather permitting, the roof opens. Uh, if the weather is poor, the roof is closed. Uh, they do open the roof um, right at sunset, I think. Uh, it's definitely early enough for you to take care of sky flats if you need to. And the same thing uh, in the morning. Uh, the roofs don't close right at the crack of dawn. They're they're open for a little bit, uh, and then they and then they close. And another common question: calibration frames. So yeah, sky flats. That's how you do it. Uh, I mean, if you have a flip flat or whatever, you can do your flats at any time. Uh, but otherwise, you're going to be limited to sky flats. And I grabbed some sky flats uh, one morning before going into work, and. They work. They work fine. No issues there at all. Um, if if the sky is clear, if there's no clouds out there, then you don't have to worry about a white T-shirt. So no no issues there. And uh, for dark frames, bias frames, dark flats, there's a sign up list in the Discord. Um, maybe I'll pull it up for you real quick. But anyway, if you put your name on this list, then on the nights of a full moon, they'll put a cap on your scope. So most people aren't going to image uh, during the full moon. I mean, even out there in Border One skies, uh, that moon is just a killer. <laughs> so, you know, your chances are you're probably not going to be imaging unless you're really brave with uh, with the HA or S2 filter. And so, 
you have them cap it and then you can get all the dark frames and bias frames and dark flats that you need. Alright, enough of the boring slide deck. Let's uh, take a look at my uh, rig that's out there. So you notice the first thing it's going to do is ask you for a pin. You set this up when you run through that um, installation process on your system. So I'm going to pause the video here and plug my pin in. Okay, so here we are. This is my uh, PC. If you've been uh, watching my videos for a, a while, you might even recognize this, um, this uh, background. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and fire up Sequence Generator Pro. This will take a moment. And here we are. Uh, notice it looks like I just recently ran a bunch of uh, uh, dark frames and that's because we had a full moon the other night and so yep I knocked out a bunch and remember what I was talking about with uh, <laughs> longer uh, exposures there you go and I mean from here it's just like it's just like running it from home I'll go ahead and connect the camera if we take a look here it should start cooling down I have it set for minus 10 in 12 minutes. There we go. Uh, <clears throat> uh, let's see. I believe the roof is still closed, although I imagine it'll open soon. Well, let's find out. Let's just take a quick one second exposure and see what it looks like. Now, uh, judging by this, I'm going to say it looks like it's uh, looks like the roof is closed still. Uh, in fact, we can check well two places to check of course uh, on their website you can go to observatory status and we actually have uh, cameras of some of their observatories it's a pretty pretty good tool boy doesn't that look awesome there although it looks like scene conditions aren't going to be great tomorrow but there you go <laughs> but all this clear that's what <laughs> that's what we're looking for right uh, and then, of course, you can go to the Discord channel, and uh, let's go back to roof status. And, yeah, so the last thing that we have here was roofs closing at 7 p.m. Oh, yeah, you know, the roofs aren't going to open today because of the, the weather's poor. But you can see in the, in the past here, they were doing some maintenance. That's what was going on here. But you could see uh, that, like, if it's, if it's going to be clear in, in some point in the middle of the evening, they'll open them. Uh, but you can get an idea. Yeah, they are opening 509. So, anyway, I don't know. There isn't really much more to show here. Uh, here, you can see these zipped files <laughs> that I started creating the copy of the data over. And, you know, I just open up a browser here and uh, connect to Google Drive and upload them. There, you can see I have the Chrome Remote Desktop app installed here. Uh, but really, I mean, there's nothing no, nothing else really special here. There's my mount uh, PhD. So, I mean, this not, none of this should look um, new to anybody. <laughs> so, there we go. Um, I hope this uh, demystified some of the process. Uh, for people that have questions. Again, I want to emphasize that this is really me showing my experience uh, with Starfront so far and uh, some suggestions that I'm making, but none of my information is official. Uh, you should get all of your information from Starfront, and all communication should go through them, especially if you've already made a reservation or you're thinking about making a reservation. And, of course, you can utilize the Discord channel to access um, or to talk to other customers and, and get a feel for what the experiences are like out there. With that said, if you've got any questions, uh, certainly you can drop them uh, on the comment section below this video uh, and I will answer all the questions as best I can. If uh, I know where to go to get the answer, I'll tell you where to go to get the answer. Uh, so hopefully some people find this useful. All right, clear skies.